All right. It's just a minute after two, so I think we'll get started. I'm Jeff Moore, and I'm the director of the Beckman Institute here at the University of Illinois. I'm really pleased to welcome you to the Smith Group Lecture for 2022. The Smith Group is the firm that designed the Beckman Institute, and they were particularly proud of this project, so much so that uh, with their interactions with our founding director, Ted Brown, they decided that um, it was fitting to uh, name uh, a lecture in their honors. And the, and, and the Smith Group um, representative, Rana Lee, is um, always been a really um, instrumental in helping uh, push Beckman to think about what's next. And um, I really appreciate the interaction that I've had with the Smith Group over the years. This year, our Smith Group lecturer is uh, Sophia Noble. She's a professor of gender studies and African-American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. And she's the co-founder and co-director of UCLA's Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. She was recognized as a MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 2021 for her groundbreaking work on algorithmic discrimination, which prompted her to found a nonprofit, Equity Engine, to accelerate investment in companies, education, and networks driven by women of color. <clears throat> Sophia earned her BA in sociology from Cal State University in Fresno, and she has an MS and PhD in library and information science right here from the University of Illinois. So we're really grateful and honored to be uh, able to count her as um, one of our alums. In fact, in 2020, she received the Distinguished Alumna Award from iSchool Alumni Association, and uh, she's the inaugural Diversity and Inclusion Award winner from the Illinois Alumni Association. Her book, Algorithms of Oppression, first came to my attention a few years ago. I, I, I think it was when I was listening to a podcast, and I remember it distinctly as being one of those moments of pause, which gives you a, a chance to think about something that we do so frequently that we don't take um, and put much thought into it. But when I heard that, it suddenly was one of those moments of pause where I realized that um, it needed to, the questions needed to be asked and I needed to be asking them and wondering what it is that the is the information that I'm getting really the information that is reflective of um, what, is, what is truth. And I thought uh, a lot about that since then. And so when Sophia's name came up as a potential Smith Group lecturer, it was a very easy decision to point to her and say we would really love and to be able to, to host you and to listen to, uh, to what you have to say. In fact, um, speaking of the book, Algorithms of Oppression, we're giving away 10 copies of that book uh, at the end of today's lecture. So we'll be alerting those of you who will be uh, uh, the recipients after the lecture and, and um, arrange to get the books to you. And with that, introduction. Let me welcome Sophia for um, her talk today, uh, talking on big tech, taking, taking on big tech, and you'll be talking about it as well. I will indeed. Thank you so much, Professor Moore, for that introduction and for all the kind things. Um, it's really an honor, I have to say, because I am an Illinois alum, I truly understand the kind of um, interdisciplinary intellectual prowess of Beckman, what it means at Illinois, but also what it means beyond the university. And um, I certainly could have never, ever imagined when I was a graduate student at Illinois that I would um, be so fortunate as to be invited to give um, such a prestigious lecture to all of you. So I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation. It really means a lot to me, and I'm very proud to get to join you today. Um, I thought that maybe I would just 
um, share with you all today some of the headlines of the book, Algorithms of Oppression, because I know that um, for some people, it's a, a new book. You're just hearing about it right now um, for the first time. Um, for others of you who might be somewhat familiar with the content and ideas of that book, um, you're curious maybe to know where this work has evolved or where it's going or what kinds of things that I'm thinking about since that work. So um, let me just start by saying that 10 years ago, when I was, is it 10? It's 10 years ago now um, that I finished my PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the information school. Back then it was called um, Gisless, the Grad School of Library and Information Science. It has since changed its name, I understand, to the Illinois School of Information Science, which is ISIS, which is not nearly as compelling to say as Gisless was. So um, I'm one of those old school alums who's still, still staying in the Gisless um, family. But, you know, back then, 10 years ago, as I was finishing up my PhD, I was really resoundingly arguing that um, algorithms and the way in which they both amplify certain kinds of information, content, advertising, even propaganda, misinformation, um, uh, misrepresentative ideas, in something, let's say, as banal as a search engine, um, was going to be kind of a crisis in the sphere of how the public comes to understand and access knowledge and information for the future. So I started my work in the information school thinking about the future of knowledge. And it was at a time when we had projects, well, first of all, Google was coming into um, its own, let's say, by 2009, 2010, 11, um, as I started thinking about the future of knowledge and what it meant that so many people in the public were turning their um, inquiries and starting their inquiries in commercial search engines, which I really understood as um, large-scale multinational advertising platforms. And this tension, um, in fact, even the way that still to this day, people talk about search engines like Google. Um, in fact, I talked to someone just last week, a very, an Emmy award-winning artist who said, you know, I thought that Google was a public good or like a nonprofit. I had no idea that it was like a multinational corporation um, that you know had all these like horizontals and verticals um, in its business. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to me to kind of watch the evolution of this conversation over the last ten years. I'm going to kind of talk us through some ideas, but I will say that um, just a decade ago, to make a claim that algorithms could be um, could have racist and sexist kind of discriminatory properties at the level in which they're encoded and certainly in their deployment um, when we start talking like the speed and scale of their deployment. This was, I just would say, this was a very, very difficult argument to make. In fact, as I was making it, um, many, many people told me there is no there there. That is just, it is impossible. And that in fact, algorithms were just math. Um, and that math could not be racist or sexist, right? Just like a very hyper reductionist way of thinking about algorithms. Algorithms were not even part of our lexicon in the general public at the time, 10 years ago. It was like a very specific kind of computer science or applied mathematical, um, you know, engineers understood this more as like a jargon or a term of art within their fields, but it certainly was not, like we didn't have these ideas like, um, you know, algorithms to live by, you know, which is like kind of a popular book now. And we just didn't, we didn't use it in our lexicon in those ways. And so um, now when I talk about my work, I think about um, why it's so important that we talk about technologies in a, in a way that is clear about its social context within which it's operating. And this to me is really the way in which I talk about algorithms and artificial intelligence and how I will be talking about it today, just to kind of frame this up for you, for all my engineering friends in the audience, we're going to be talking about 
um, not in the narrow sense, but in the broader sense. And the other reason I want to say that is because um, now I find that the kind of analogous way that I would talk about AI and algorithms is to say that um, certainly if we asked a biologist, what is it to be human? What, you know, what is a human? They might tell us that ultimately um, to be human is to be cells and mitochondria, right? But typically when we're asking that question, we are not asking in that kind of reductionist way that is very specific within the discipline or domain of um, biological sciences. We're really talking about the human experience of a broader contextual landscape. And so this is what um, uh, is important for me to kind of convey here today. All right. So um, let's see if I can advance the slide. All right. So let me start by saying that my work is kind of sitting in dialogue and in relationship to other critical theorists and scholars who have been thinking about um, the interplay of a variety of different kinds of digital technologies and histories of digital technologies with communities of color um, and more broadly in the public. And um, last year, well, in 2020, through last year, many people in the tech sector were asking us at UCLA, at the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, which I co-founded with another Illinois alum, Dr. Sarah Roberts, and which I lead right now, um, asking us to help them better understand their roles, their responsibilities, and the kind of education that they need, particularly on the heels of the uprising um, for George Floyd and the seeking of justice, and of course, trying to understand not only um, the way in which race and power work in our society, but also what, you know, what do individuals and industries um, owe the public by way of um, strengthening democracy, strengthening civil rights, um, affording all people protections, um, and you know, uh, the experience of a high quality of life, not seeing these kinds of disparate um, um, injustices that are pointed most acutely toward um, Black, um, Latinx, and working class and poor people. And so these were some of the um, books that we were recommending. And I put them here just for you to like, you know, grab a screenshot or something. You can also find these. Um, we have a kind of a sil syllabus at the Critical Race and Digital Studies um, group, which is a research group um, that meets out of NYU. Um, I'm on the advisory uh, uh, committee there. And we've tried to kind of corral a number of researchers who are studying um, race, gender, um, power, and society, you know, kind of, and technology. And from lots of different vantage points, if you're interested in video games or, you know, the history of surveillance, for example, and Simone Brown's incredible work, um, Dark Matter, like there's a lot of um, different kinds of histories. I also find that this is very, these are very important texts to teach. Um, so for those of you who are trying to figure out how do I enter these conversations, um, in my own teaching, these are certainly people that um, whose work would be in incredibly instructive um, in that process. And so just um, want to kind of situate and locate that my work sits in a community of critical theorists of, um, of software, hardware, the internet, and um, let's say histories of technology, science and technology. Um, for, for me, I would say that um, where my research in this community of scholars uh, is kind of most um, directly pointed is in thinking about documenting and um, understanding the long history of harms against Black communities, um, both in the United States and beyond, but but more acute, you know, more specifically in the United States, and kind of the role of search companies and social media companies in profiting um, from a variety of different types of propaganda or harmful narrations or um, uh, visible kinds of results that have um, uh, a harmful effect 
on communities of color. And so this kind of starts from, you know, early work in 2013, directly out of the dissertation to uh, more recently, um, you know, uh, new books and new work that I'm thinking about. And so I'll share that with you here in just a few minutes. Um, What's really interesting to me is that, you know, looking back even on um, some of this work, um, you know, in 2013, just talking about the way in which search technologies work to um, uh, misrepresent uh, Black women and girls. Um, And then, of course, in 2014, um, publishing uh, after the murder of Trayvon Martin, um, and we are trying to kind of make sense of the way in which the internet has, um, you know, been a major part of um, young people, um, both kind of finding their own racial educational tools, um, engaging in like their own education, but also using social media to do things like, um, you saw this um, tremendously in 2012 and 13, um, where, um, you know, young men were um, uh, recreating or trying to reenact the death of Trayvon Martin um, in in really painful, egregious ways. Um, And of course, this big, these trends going viral, um, not unlike other trends that are going viral today in social media. And the degree to which social media companies really profit from the virality of this kind of degrading, dehumanizing content. Um, And then, you know, what was very interesting to me was to see that kind of talking about search and the, the problems of the way in which we think of it as a neutral technology, we think of it as just simply providing, um, you know, the most relevant, incredible kinds of of content to the public. Um, Actually, we start to see by 2015, 16, 17, the same kinds of logics that I talked about in um, 2013 start to show up in the electoral political process. And um, so this is where, you know, writing about kind of Google and the misinformed public for the Chronicle, and then eventually kind of what does it mean that some of the most um, titillating, um, harmful types of content is some of the most profitable kinds of content that moves around in large scale digital media platforms and writing about that for Black Camera. All right. So these are the kinds of things that led up to and were part of and included in the book, Algorithms of Repression, which um, went to print uh, in at the end of 2016 and is published in 2018. Um, For all of my friends here who are humanists and social scientists or people who write books, it's incredibly difficult to do research on the internet and write about the internet in book format because by the time the things that you've been writing about come out in print, a lot of things are starting to shift and change. And so um, certainly um, we can talk about uh, what it means to, you know, um, do and write um, do research and write about the internet. And as you're going to print, things are shifting. But one of the things that this book is, is it's a contribution to kind of thinking about um, monopolies, information monopolies like Google and um, and um, using some of the theories and methods that come out of a tradition of black studies to interrogate the kinds of things that we find. And certainly there had been many books written prior to 2018 about Google, but I think this book comes along and it really shifts um, the audience of inquiry, kind of who are we talking about when we talk about the public and Google. And um, it's certainly rather than focusing on the leadership and these kind of, um, you know, great men of tech narratives, it looks at communities that are often overlooked or not even thought about. And of course, I've talked to many people over the years, um, both who are um, Googlers and ex-Googlers, who um, uh, many of them are under NDA, but who will say things like, you know, the things you put in that book, you know, I'm blinking three times for yes, um, yes, you know, more, um, because there are um, the kinds of research questions 
that help us uh, help illuminate or kind of um, bring light to issues and ideas and people that people, you know, had not been thinking about prior to that. And of course, I know from my own training and working in a tech company that one of the primary ways in which we think about um, designing technologies is we think about kind of a universal user. Like what's the broadest imaginary of the type of user who might be using a technology? And then we design and um, think about our um, user experience in the context of universal users. One of the things I try to explain is that concepts of universalism often default to um, the status quo or the most powerful type of profile in our societies. And so marginalized people or um, often ethnic minorities, children, um, in some cases, LGBTQIA plus communities, women are often not conceptualized in terms of their specific um, relationship to um, how programming is done and what its outcomes are. And so this book was really interested in trying to look again in these places. So let me give you kind of like what the um, quintessential kind of search result. Um, but of course, the book is full of many, many, many different kinds of case studies. It is not just this one. This one, this particular search, I thought was um, exemplary of the challenge before us when it comes to things like search technologies. So I'm not sure if you can see this, but in two, from 2009 to 2012, when you did keyword searches, this is a keyword search on the terms black girls. And of course this held consistent for Latina girls, for Asian girls. When you did keyword searches on girls of color in the US, um, the first page of results was almost completely pornography or hypersexualized content, kind of sexually commodifying content, websites. And of course, these are in what Google would call kind of the organic search results. Um, at the time in 2012, by the time this work was completed, there was a very robust set of arguments going on among media and communication scholars and computer scientists about um, paid advertising versus organic search. Um, there was a, a, a sense that there was like a clear line of delineation, that there was no relationship between organic search results and paid search results, even though there was, you know, important research showing that the public could not tell the difference between these different kinds of results that showed up on the front page of a, a Google search return. And what I tried to do in this book was go back behind the scenes into AdWords being the kind of engine that drives search to show the relationship between um, search engine optimization and the kinds of results that come to the first page, whether it's paid advertising or these alleged organic results. And to show that, the, that those with the most capital, those with the most money are able to better optimize. And of course, in this case, for women and girls of color, we found that the porn industry had the most money and the most technical skill also in terms of metadata and their ability to really hyperlink their sites and game the um, systems to make themselves highly visible. But we also found that um, that meant that search technology, search companies were actually profiting handsomely from that kind of um, idea. The other thing that was so interesting to me about these results for women and girls of color was that you didn't have to add the words porn and you didn't have to add the word sex. Girls of color were synonymous with sex. And of course, this still holds true today for, um, for some communities. And so um, while there's been a lot of visibility around Black girls from this work, there's still work to be done for Asian girls and Latina girls. And um, as these things are kind of um, um, worked on, the, the many, many different kinds of problems, I will tell you that my book was just like a big book of tickets that got handed. Those of you who work in tech companies or work in tech, you know that when there's a problem, um, we open up a ticket. This is our documentation to figure out how we're going to document solving that problem. And then we close the ticket once we have fixed the problem. And so my book is a big book of tickets that got, um, unfortunately, I'm sure, thrown on some um, software engineer's desk at Google and was told to solve it. Um, what we've seen is some progress on some of these results, but we also see some 
things that are structurally built into the logics of how search works that cannot be fixed easily. And so um, writing about this phenomena really was about trying to help us understand what does it mean that we think and and conceptualize uh, users in this universal way? Who was the imagined user that might do a search and want these kinds of results? So who was the who was the imagined user that was looking for these kinds of results? Was it black girls themselves or black women themselves? Likely not. So they were not kind of conceptualized into um, kind of the UX framing and testing. Certainly, um, um, what does it mean for minoritized communities to be kind of under the tyranny of the majority? Um, the majority of searchers, but also the conceptualization that programmers have about um, who is in that universal user. And of course, what happens when we apply these logics that many people hold about search, which is that what we find on the first page is simply a matter of what most people are searching for. And of course, this to me was one of the um, um, ideas that I really tried to challenge in this work, which is to say, well, if that were true, um, which of course there is some role of of what people are looking for that affects um, the algorithms as we as we can learn about them because they're certainly black box and pr- proprietary and we can't see them. We know, of course, that what people are searching for plays some role. But the question is, what does that mean for people who are minoritized, like children, like communities of color, who will never be able to compete on this kind of majoritarian model of design. So these are the kinds of provocations that I raise in this work to really help us think about the kinds of imaginaries that are shaping um, technology design. All right. Now, obviously, these ideas about the hypersexualized um, Black girl and Black woman are not new. These predate the internet um, by hundreds of years. In fact, One of the things that I try to make clear is the degree to which the past constantly is encoded into projections into the future. And this is um, really important to me, especially now as I look at and kind of turn a lot of my attention toward predictive analytics, predictive technologies. What does it mean that old data sets and old ideas, old narratives, old power relations and current power relations um, um, systems of dominance Um, and oppression get re-encoded and normalized and naturalized. One of the reasons why I was so and still continue to be so um, focused on search is because I, um, unlike social media, and I have lots of colleagues who study social media, I look at social media, I mean, I'm engaged in in conversations, certainly for sure about Facebook. Um, I think that the public has come to be more sensitized about social media and the subjective nature of it. People know that they are in networks, let's say with their friends and colleagues, with people with whom they have accepted a relationship or entered into some type of relationship through following or friending and this kind of behavior. So they know this idea that Eli Pariser talks about, about the filter bubble. Conceptually, they kind of understand that they are influenced by um, people in their network. Search technology is quite different though. People, um, and if you look at the Pew research on search engine use from 2012 um, um, in particular, uh, people often report out that they think of search as being um, neutral, objective, credible, that um, upwards of 70%, um, more than 70% of people who use search engines think that it is um, fair, Um, in its representation, again, credible. And so to me, this is where it's so important because I find that many people, um, while they come across things like propaganda, misinformation, things that seem sketchy in social media, they will immediately turn to a search engine to fact check it and to verify it. So this now opens us up into a greater Pandora's box, if you will, about the role of search in our society. And of course, I owe so much um, to the kind of um, intellectual lineage of people like Frank Frank Pasquale, um, Alex Halavey, Siva by Jonathan, uh, Wendy Chun, you know, people who have really helped us kind of challenge 
the way in which software is both designed, but also what search means in our society. And of course, I'm trying to nuance this with more of a racialized and gendered analysis um, uh, in, in this work. All right, oops, well, I didn't um, go all the way to thank you and we're over. Um, all right, um, so the key research contribution, I mean, you see here, I put this, um, my book in relationship with um, Ruha Benjamin, Race After Technology, Virginia Eubanks, Automating Inequality, um, uh, Data Feminism, um, uh, Design Justice. These are very important books that, I, that this book is in. Um, relationship to you, all of these books kind of coming out within a couple of years of each other, um, really trying to help us. I think each of us from different, whether it's a social welfare system or understanding um, abolitionist uh, perspectives on technology or the way in which data is gendered um, um, or how we can think about justice in the ways in which uh, designers work. Um, for me, I think our work together and my work specifically has really helped to build this field of critical race and digital studies. And um, I'm thinking about critical internet studies kind of rooted out of the things we can learn from black studies and gender studies. And um, ultimately, um, you know, my work is very pointedly um, talking about big tech and the ways in which we can take it on, which of course is the theme of today's talk. Um, there are other things you can read. Um, I would just say these are other books that I have either edited or contributed to that are thinking about the ethics um, and um, issues of justice around technology. And so these are things that you can take a look at if you're interested. All right. So where does that take us to today? I think part of what we're dealing with is that we're looking at both search technologies and social media companies um, really posing threats to democracy. I'm a member of the Real Facebook Oversight Board. You might know of this. This is kind of a group of critics, mostly scholars, um, some um, civil rights leaders um, and organizations, Color of Change, Anti-Defamation League. Um, journalists like um, Nobel um, Peace Prize winner Maria Reza, um, uh, many different kinds of people from, um, uh, for the most part, English speaking uh, countries in the EU, UK, and the United States, um, who are concerned with the way in which, for example, companies like Facebook are. Um, uh, purportedly self-regulating, but in fact, take very little action toward um, the way in which their technologies are implicated in collapsing democracy and modern democracies around the world. And so this group has been very active and um, uh, I've been a part of that. Certainly, we're seeing many more articles uh, over the last decade, um, but especially over the last two or three years, helping us understand um, the role that large-scale monopoly tech companies like Facebook and Google have played in um, undermining um, publics around the world. At the um, end of Algorithms of Oppression, you can, um, if you see here to, I guess, my right here, this um, Google top news um, link for final election results goes to fake news site with false numbers. This was a... a a case that I closed the book on where I showed how um, just within 48 hours after the 2016 presidential election, when you did a search on this kind of final election results, and this was a news story that went viral, um, the very first search result took you to a propaganda site that reported out that Donald Trump had won the popular vote in the United States. Now, this is really important. Because, of course, we all know that Donald Trump had won the Electoral College and that Hillary Clinton had won the popular vote. But, you know, this was so important to me, this um, uh, result that came in uh, to include, because when we look around and we ask ourselves, well, why don't people have like a shared understanding of facts? Um, part of it is because the platforms that everyone is driven to, and dare I say that even scholars, um, teaching assistants, parents, teachers, K through 12, um, pretty much uh, a lot of people, let's say with the exception of medical doctors and lawyers, as far as I can tell so far, 
are constantly telling um, family members, kids, students um, uh, to just Google it, right? And to just like that you can find the answer, anything you can find an answer to on the internet. And of course, if you don't know exactly where to go on the internet, you don't have a specific URL like the old days for those of us who've been on the internet for a very long time, which I know many people watching this, uh, those of us who've been on since like the late 80s, I know people who've been on since before then, um, I came onto the internet in the late 80s uh, in the tech space before the you know graphic user interface and um, Netscape, of course, we know. Uh, growing out of the uh, Mosaic project at Illinois. Um, for those of us who have been on the internet for a long time, we understood the way in which information was organized in these kind of more subjective communities and directories that were made by subject matter experts. And that you know, people were kind of had a much more, uh, let's say, humble um, approach to understanding. We were doing the best we could to maybe inch our way toward shared resources and knowledge that we may be able to um, uh, make available more broadly. Um, that's very different than the current environment that we're in, where people truly believe if they just Google it, they will get the truth and they will get the facts. And so if we have a society that is organized around these kinds of technologies as the standard bearers of truth, and they are so susceptible to propaganda, misinformation, misrepresentative information about minority, minoritized people. Um, um, how could we imagine that this would not be a threat to democracy, to civil rights, to sovereign and human rights? And of course, indeed, we see that that is the case. So let me pivot here just quickly to say, you know, what are some of the interventions? Well, one of the things we know is that for the last, I would say, easily 15 years, um, um, the part of the reason we know what we know about the vulnerabilities for the public um, are because, quite frankly, um, women, um, feminist, critical race scholars have been at the forefront of this kind of work. And many of us have not been in engineering departments. We have been in a variety of different kinds of departments. I've always been in African-American studies. I'm in gender studies now. I've been in information studies, media studies, communications. Many people are in different kinds of science and technology studies, even history departments, sociology departments, uh, you know, like popcorn and, you know, one in different institutions around the world doing this work. But we haven't had the same kind of concentrated centers of expertise that are well-funded, um, and we need that now more than ever. In fact, I would say that Black women have been, scholars have been at the forefront of much of this kind of work that's helped us understand these issues, so much so that these conversations are now quite mainstream. And um, people think that these conversations started with like, let's say a film like The Social Dilemma or something like this is just, you know, kind of ludicrous. But this is in many ways the kinds of erasures that are also happening that then leave um, our centers and our research vulnerable and underfunded. Many of us do not take um, funding from tech companies. Um, certainly for us at UCLA in the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, we do not take any funding from big tech companies. So, of course, this means we don't have very much money. Um, but this is important. And I think these kinds of collaborations are really important. Of course, this gets difficult when we are trying to partner with um, engineers um, who are often in departments that are well-funded by tech companies. And so, um, you know, we have these conundrums and these kind of... Um, um, crises um, in various places around academia and trying to do this type of work. Um, there are some new and emergent um, uh, centers um, that truly need um, and deserve support. I mean, obviously, I would uh, say our center, but, you know, I'm looking at others, um, scholars who are organized um, out of Joy Bolomini's work when she was a student at MIT. She's now Dr. Bolomini um, uh, coming out of MIT. Um, and of course, many of you know her uh, groundbreaking work with Tamit, Dr. Tamit Jabru, um, Deb Raj, um, um, doing work around uh, um, facial recognition. Um, their very famous study, Gender Shades, which helps us understand that facial recognitions have the lowest efficacy for Black women 
Um, and for people of color, people with darker skin who are not detected by facial recognition technologies. And her work is really well documented in the film Coded Bias. Um, if you haven't seen it, see it. Um, certainly people like Ruha Benjamin at Princeton with the Ida B. Wells um, uh, Just Data Lab. Um, uh, there's the um, SEEDS um, project at UC Santa Barbara, very important. Tamit Jabru, of course, um, who I just mentioned, many of you know, was the head of um, AI and ethics, uh, the ethical AI team at Google. And she and her team um, were fired and or quit after she published a very important paper with her collaborators from the University of Washington about the um, racism and the kinds of possibilities, um, very like the evidence of harm um, and racist bias in natural language processing um, technologies that were being developed at Google that were that are kind of being migrated to um, their search technologies. Um, as well as the incredible environmental cost and impact of large-scale AI modeling. Um, Dr. Jabru uh, was fired from Google over that paper and has subsequently started the Distributed AI Research Institute, DARE, which is um, a place for scholars who are interested in doing this work but not being fired um, for doing it. Um, very, very important work. And of course, I mentioned the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. For, for me, um, since, you know, um, being granted the MacArthur Fellowship, one of the things that I've seen is that there are a number of um, Black women and women of color who are also trying to do really important work like this and scaling it up. I know from my own experience how difficult it was. It felt like pushing a, a boulder up a mountain to say that algorithms and AI could be race, racist and sexist and discriminatory, how difficult it was to kind of make that legible in the world, um, which of course is now quite a mainstream, almost non-controversial um, concept that many people are working on. Um, so the equity engine is a place where um, women who are doing really important work that needs to scale up and visibility can be supported. Um, the last thing I'll say um, here quickly is just that um, um, the center um, where we've been able to concentrate our work has been able to hire an artist in residence. So obviously we're doing a lot of work to try to make visible this kind of work um, in the world. All right. So what have we learned since, what have I learned and what, I, what have I thought about? And this is really at the heart of this kind of idea of taking on big tech. One of the things that I've, you know, I've been giving talks about this and working on a new book right now is um, watching over the last 10 years, this paradigm shift that I have been a part of um, with others in making something that seemed impossible to understand quite legible in the world, what, what does it take to make those kinds of paradigm shifts? I mean, these paradigm shifts are so great now that places that were formerly the epicenters of um, uh, leading technology innovation, MIT, Illinois, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, um, um, these kinds of places have been now have kind of put them Stanford have put themselves like in the forefront of these conversations about ethics and AI. And I find this really interesting because, you know, we have what in essence has been the places that have previously denied the possibility of harm now somehow like leapfrogging all of the people who have been talking about the harm and, and becoming well-funded to do work that in many ways is still kind of focused on techno solutionism or like perfecting algorithms or perfecting AI. And I find that this is not only a challenge, but also not really leading to the kinds of paradigm shifts that we really need that are much bigger and greater in terms of the, the, the stakes for society. So I think about um, kind of other paradigms that we have lived under um, maybe not ourselves directly, but our, you know, our ancestors living under, let's say, the era of big cotton. You think about the era of big cotton, which was predicated upon the transatlantic slavery, uh, slave trade, the institution of slavery, the enslavement of African peoples, the occupation of indigenous lands, 
and the normalization of that. There had to be a normalization of things like human trafficking, which just seems so outside of our realm of consciousness and ability to conceive of today. Of course, these practices are still happening um, around the world. But, you know, how is it that those practices could happen and everybody could kind of get up and make pancakes and go to work the next day, right? Um, Or every morning. Um, And so how did that shift happen that we could see the inhumanity of the transatlantic slave trade and the institution of slavery in the United States? And what we know is that it was really, truly a handful of abolitionists, people who really helped make legible the moral crisis of such a system and who helped to kind of help us disprove the logics of, um, let's say that the American economy or that the economy of the Americas, those economies um, could thrive without those institutions. If you recall, many of the ways in which people talked about, especially, I mean, this is like the, you know, basis of the civil war, the way in which people conceptualized the institutions slavery was very much about economic power and that um, the economies of the Southern um, uh, states could not flourish, could not thrive without such an institution. So how did we create those paradigm shifts? How did abolitionists do that? What can we learn from them that could apply to today? And of course, more recently in, you know, our own lives, and I got to find my pen, um, you know, when I try to talk to my students about things like the Um, era of big tobacco and what it was like um, to grow up because I'm from the seventies. I'm just so Gen X. I mean, I remember like, I'm sure that my mom was chain smoking like two packs of cigarettes in the hospital when she pushed me out. I dare say this, the doctor was probably smoking a cigarette too. Students can't believe that today that that was, I mean, they, they watch one episode of Mad Men and they can't believe that that was reality, but most of us probably can remember that. Um, So what was it that created such a shift around big tobacco? And of course, there's a lot to learn. Part of that included civil um, action and lawsuits against big tech. We had, we want to remember that especially around the tobacco industry, which is something I think we can learn here around the tech industries, is that um, there were full-blown research centers, there were scientists, there were medical doctors, there were um, um, AstroTurf um, consumer organizations that were all funded by be- Big Tobacco to create enough disorientation around the credibility of research that pointed to the harms of Big Tobacco, not just for the smoker or the user, but also these like secondary tertiary effects of harm and you know public health crises that were eminent, emanating from um, that product. And I wonder to what degree we can pull back and understand this moment that we're living in, where we have a highly unregulated tech sector that is really allowed to deploy a number of products and services out onto the public with no oversight, um, where there's a narrative that the American economies and economies around the world could not function without the ubiquity of these kinds of technologies. And... um, that also fund a, a, a lot of narratives favorable to their own interests. And I gave a much more detailed talk um, um, about what those repairs might start to look like in a talk here with Ethan Zuckerman um, around kind of why we need public infrastructures, why we need um, to invest in more democratic uh, technologies. And um, of course, I think about the work of people like um, Eli Pariser and digital public space and the ways in which we could reconceptualize and reimagine um, our engagements with the sector. All right. So what are some things we can do? Of course, I think we must be integrating these more critical um, perspectives into the way we think about science and technology and artificial intelligence. Um, This seems really urgent and important. Even technologists who have been at the forefront of um, conceptualizing um, technology, and here I think of people like Stuart Russell 
at Berkeley, my colleague at Berkeley, I was recently on a panel with him. And, you know, here's someone who is the architect of modern artificial intelligence, who's written a textbook that in textbooks that are used in over 1400 different computer science programs and departments around the world, who has singularly dedicated his life now to trying to call back the kinds of ideas that have been put into the world after he saw the first autonomous um, drones um, kill people in Libya and really understanding that autonomous weapons that human beings cannot control are not only a huge threat to um, our humanity, but the logics that undergird them also are too. And so I've really been inspired by listening to his recent talks and thinking about um, where that marries up with people who are coming out of fields like Black Studies and Critical Ethnic Studies, where we know that many of those kinds of technologies are deployed upon our communities first. They're beta tested around the world on vulnerable people. I think we need, of course, more of these centers of expertise. This opportunity even to speak into the Beckman community is really valuable because, again, it's a space where different kinds of epistemologies and ways of knowing the world and ways of thinking about research can collide and come together. And so um, I hope this will be the beginning of, of many more kinds of possibilities that can emanate um, out of these uh, cross-disciplinary um, conversations. Um, we need to be hiring more people who are grounded in humanities and social sciences and to work alongside as equal partners, um, engineering teams, both in industry and in academia. Um, I was, you know, intrigued by seeing things like a new um, uh, college of, um, uh, um, uh, what is the exact name, AI, uh, that was embedded into the College of Humanities at the University of Oxford a few years ago, and thinking about what does it mean to study artificial intelligence in these like kind of humanistic and social scientific um, spaces. And so I think there's like some interesting ideas that are um, um, being tried out right now. Um, and, you know, of course, this work has to have impact. I mean, the, the to me, these, um, when, Facebook, for example, can create a, um, an empty profile and put it out. And you might have seen this study just uh, about three months ago um, that Facebook um, issued out and shared out. You know, they made an empty profile and within a week, she was completely this empty profile with no, you know, and identifiable information was completely right-wing radicalized and turned into like a QAnon um, a uh, supporter. I mean, this is really important work around the direct effects on our society and on um, various publics. And so policymakers and, and others are really interested in this work. And I think it's very important. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, and maybe that'll give us a time if there's like a, you know, a question or, or so that I can answer. Um, let me just say that I think, um, uh, things are shifting and there is a possibility for things to shift. Certainly now, today, we have thousands of people who are doing work in these areas. Um, we have people looking at robotics, different kinds of AI, um, uh, just um, really trying to take on a, a, a multifaceted approaches. I mean, there isn't a month that doesn't pass by that some major corporation um, isn't trying to figure out what the implications of using predictive analytics, predictive modeling, of course, underlying search is predictive modeling. Um, but thinking about that in their own business practices, I think there's a huge opportunity, especially for scholars and scholars who are thinking about um, the impact of these technologies on society to really move to the forefront and um, be better supported. And so I just want to say that I'm grateful to have been supported and to have this opportunity to share. And, um, and I think I'll just leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was really wonderful. I um, particularly appreciate the bringing awareness to, uh, to this broad community uh, that the Beckman Institute is able to reach. And in fact, you know, the benefit of our technology today is that really we can um, uh, connect uh, through, uh, through the internet to our community, which is um, obviously there's the good and, and the, the downside of, of this. Um, 
We're going to ask uh, that our participants uh, type questions into the chat and I think Meg is going to read them. Um, and while there are questions queuing up, <clears throat> let me um, open uh, the question. I was really intrigued by the um, parallel that you drew to big industry. You mentioned cotton and tobacco and, and now tech. And, and I wonder, you know, a couple of things. First of all, uh, uh, are, is there something fundamentally different about tech compared to, um, you know, the uh, atrocities of, of, of cotton or the misinformation around tobacco or the lack of awareness of, of its um, detriment? Is there something fundamentally different about technology that we need to be um, concerned about today? and uh, trying to address the problems that, that you've brought up? Well, I think certainly that, um, you know, it's, it, it, it depends on the like level, the, the let's say the um, unit of analysis by which you're measuring this. Okay, so by, let's say if the unit of analysis is middle-class people like us who are connected here and, and students who are not middle-class working poor people who are connecting by technology, um, to have a lecture, the unit of analysis, we would say, like, generally, we don't have, we don't see any harm. And in fact, we see only the affordances and consequences. And I try to really talk in terms of affordances and consequences. This is to borrow from Arnold Pacey, for example, who's written about the, the culture and practices of technology. So thinking of technology as a practice, a social practice um, that is nuanced. If you pulled back the unit of analysis, though, and you thought, well, and you looked at like the internet of things, what does it take for us to link all these devices to the network? What are, what are the labor implications? And I've written about this, for example, um, in articles where you have, you have to have Congolese mineral miners, right? You have to have miners who are working in some of the harshest conditions in the world, um, in the Congo and in Australia. Um, you have to have really um, challenging human rights violating manufacturing processes, which we know are happening as well, both in the US and, you know, in other parts of the world where people are living in um, really like life-threatening kinds of situations in order um, in harmful situations uh, to make the products, the electronics that attach to the network and the network itself, which by the way, is also material. And, um, uh, and then you have to talk about like, you know, where we enter, most of us enter in the narrowest band, which is as consumers of, of, you know, in the kind of whole life cycle of the, this project. But when we're done with, you know, the latest, you know, device, um, where does it go? Well, most people think it goes to, you know, to a recycling center. But, you know, I spent um, three summers ago, I was in Accra, Ghana, looking at a formerly beautiful, pristine wetland turned waste site that was full of electronics. And so the question then is the environmental cost, who pays that cost? And of course, then we start getting these different units of analysis. We might say, is it worth it? Is it worth it? You know, maybe it's not. Um, so I think that's what's really important for us to understand. And when we pull out actually to a broader unit of analysis and we account for all of the people and material conditions that are touching our technologies, we actually might say that um, we need a, a radical reimagining um, of what we think is liberating us. Thank you. I'm going to turn the floor over to Meg, who's going to moderate the q and A. I I have gotten so many questions, which is wonderful because I think it means people are truly engaged. So I'm just going to start from the beginning of the ones I received. Um, are there any search engines that are more ethical and where do you recommend starting with inquiries? If we talk, if we put it in the context of what I just talked about, no, of course not, right? Um, uh, you know, I try not to endorse any particular product because I think that each of them has a different set of problems. 
Um, obviously, I mean, I use all of many different search engines. Um, I use DuckDuckGo uh, uh, because I understand, you know, it doesn't track me in the same way that Google does. Um, I often use Google and then I will compare to see what else. Uh, I use library databases to see what happens there. Sometimes I use trusted news sites and I search there. Um, it really depends. I think probably for shopping and consumer um, products uh, and services, you know, that's what Google was made for. It's very good at that. But, you know, you can complicate as well. I mean, one of the things that I find example uh, that I love, whose work I love is Lisa Parks, um, who's now, she was formerly at MIT. She's, I think she's back at UC Santa Barbara. Um, like her work on Google Maps and how maps reorient us to space and communities um, such that, you know, Google Maps, for example, will not often document, um, you know, histories of people of color. It won't tell us certain things about the texture and culture and meaning of space and place, um, but it will certainly give us Starbucks. So, you know, these kinds of things, like in terms of like acculturating us to consumption and to engagement with our space um, on those terms, rather than necessarily understanding space and place. Um, and of course, you know, the politics of mapping. So I find those kinds of things really interesting. And, you know, I try to just, um, I, I certainly don't tell people don't use these things any more than I tell people don't go to the movies. I just say, read them with a critical eye, look for what's missing and what, you know, what the kind of power and shaping forces are in them. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I work at a data science software company and sit on our AI ethics council and trying to get our council to take some action. But I wonder what changes you would like to see companies like mine make in the near or longer term. I think one of the things for people working in data science that's really crucial is um, questioning the validity and like the content and the making of data sets that you use. Many data science, um, many data scientists that I work with and, and even some that I train uh, are just trying to find data sets anywhere um, to use to help make their kind of um, train their machine learning algorithms and do other kinds of modeling. And um, now there's a good body of work um, out about, uh, you know, the flaws of um, data sets or the, the, the inherent power, the histories, the flattening of history into data sets. Um, we see this especially around like finance, um, insurance, um, the way in which data sets contribute to re reinforcing redlining, you know, um, that's a, you know, very, very obvious example those kinds of examples need to be brought into teams and people need to be engaging with that, that research and, and those um, stories. The markup does a very good job. It's an investigative journalism outfit that does a very good job of translating and storytelling this kind of research into lay audiences that, that like, you know, non-technical people, but also technical people can get quickly without reading a bunch of books. Um, and I would say following that work is important because, uh, there has to be mitigation. There certainly are ways in which people are trying to think about how to create um, interventions in data sets that like uphold a more just set of outcomes rather than reinforcing um, without understanding or knowing. Of course, recidivism prediction software, criminal sentencing software, this has been another place where we have very important case studies about how it can go wrong using um, you know, just data sets uncritically. Um, so I would say that that's the place to get a very deep education and then figure out the degree, like what are the limits um, as well? What are, what are predictive modeling um, projects that shouldn't exist? Um, GPT-3 is a really good example of like, just because we can do it, should we? Um, and I think that these moral questions, data scientists and scientists and engineers writ large cannot say those are not there are issues to contend with they absolutely are um there's you know the, the days of like a, a false artificial separation between science and politics are over 
Um, they've really been over since the atomic bomb, the, you know, the making of the atomic bomb. Um, but we really have to um, take seriously our role as makers. Okay, thank you. Um, how much more time? I have a, a bunch more questions. How much more time do you have? I could go till a quarter after. Okay, great. I'll just keep asking. Okay. Um, can you, you speak can. about generative models that are somewhat different than search? Generative models. Uh, you know, I mean, my realm of expertise is really around um, information retrieval in libraries and other kind of like knowledge institutions like that. I think that there are certainly um, more complex, I think. I mean, search really, uh, you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin really borrowed their um, thinking about um, search from the citation analytic uh, literature that came out of library science. And that's really important history. One of the things that we understand in libraries and even among um, large scale database um, driven publishers in our field is the tremendous amount of subjectivity, the kinds of controlled vocabularies that need to be used, the um, importance of metadata in like structuring how people will access knowledge so that people can come from, let's say many, many different kinds of disciplines and stumble upon like a shared kind of common body or corpus of knowledge. Um, so I think there's something to learn there. Um, they struggle themselves even in that place. And that is, a, I think, a much more complex um, ecosystem of organizing knowledge um, than the, the predictive advertising models, I think. I mean, just from what I can see. Uh, so I think there's something to learn there. Um, again, you know, it's a, um, another reason why the library science people are really important. I mean, you know, imagine that, uh, you know, librarians have been stewarding knowledge for thousands of years, um, which far predates the internet and this kind of digital moment we're in. And I think we should be thinking about what it means also to put so much of our, um, you know, critical information and knowledge um, projects into digital spaces solely because we know that um, they are just as fragile as a brick and mortar archive museum or library that can, let's say, burn to the ground. Um, certainly knowledge is also fragile when it's um, um, obsolete and you can't access it uh, like, like the garage the box, sorry, the box of um, floppy disks that I have in my garage that I also cannot access, um, you know, or if the power grid goes down, um, sorry, my dog's losing it. Uh, so, you know, those are things I think we should be thinking about in terms of other kinds of um, institutional models. What first gave you the idea that search algorithms might be biased? Was there a certain aha moment were you convinced from the outset it was true, or did you think this is something I should research and find out more? I was had just come from the advertising industry when I went back to grad school. I went back to grad school in my late 30s, early 40s, and I thought of search as something that got optimized by advertisers because we had been in that, we were just like, that was just starting around 2005, 2006. Um, so I uh, was curious that when I got to Illinois and I was going to grad school that so many people were talking about Google like the new public library. And of course, we were in the throes of the Google book digitization project. All the academic universities were in on that. And then, um, you know, Robert Darton, who was the university librarian at Harvard, did an about face on the book digitization project. And of course, the... Um, you know, French minister of culture was like, you know, taking on Google in court and was arguing that like Google was encroaching upon their um, French patrimony by, by digitizing all of like French culture in their museums and, you know, libraries. And um, so there was like a, you know, heat was forming around like, what is Google up to? And I was interested in that conversation very much. And so those, those other things, so that, that I didn't come up with like thinking about Google in a vacuum, 
history was kind of unfolding around what digitization was. And of course, there were a lot of, of people who were suspicious that these um, large scale digitization projects out of academic universities in particular were being used to train machine learning algorithms. And that was not being talked about publicly at all. Um, and so, uh, except for like in a documentary um, that was like super critical of Google. So, you know, those things, of course, you know, um, Aaron Swartz's death um, really impacted me and just the idea that trying to bring scholarly articles and information out from behind the paywall um, and, um, and then being uh, like, you know, prosecuted by um, the federal government and, you know, this young man um, and his work. I mean, there were just a lot of things happening in the zeitgeist. And that really led me to say, like, how can I talk about what's happening here? And, you know, that really led to like doing the keyword searches and being in conversation with a lot of people and realizing that might be a way in. Thank you for your important work. I noticed your things we can do speak to people with power. Are there things that the less powerful among us can do as well? I think the less powerful among us are the people in the lead in this conversation. I will say that. And I think we should be listening to them. In LA, where I live, the Stop LHPD Spine Coalition, for example, has been, I think, one of the singular most important voices in Los Angeles about predictive policing, for example, and the way in which predictive policing was beta tested on poor people on Skid Row, people experiencing homelessness, uh, which are disproportionately African American in, La in Los Angeles. Um, I think something like just just over 40% of people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles are, are African American, which is far out paces our percentage of the population. So I think um, they have, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road, where the modeling gets deployed is mostly on vulnerable people. And so those are the people that we have, that have the best knowledge about how it works, how it doesn't work, how it's harming them. And, you know, for us in our center at UCLA, that's who we focus on because we think that's where the, um, best learning can come from. And those are the people who need the most support um, to stop harmful deployments against them. Okay, last question. Is there any other industry that could influence big tech into using their efforts for good? For example, architecture, medicine, education? Well, I think broadly, obviously, I'm an educator, uh, so I'm going to double down on education. I wrote a piece during COVID for Noema Magazine about the loss of public goods to big tech. And in it, I argued that what has happened, in essence, is that the tech sector has created a tremendous conditions of vulnerability especially for public institutions, public schools, public universities, public libraries, public media, because they, in essence, um, don't pay taxes. They get massive tax subsidies and breaks. They offshore their profits. They don't reinvest, but they use our public infrastructure in order to enrich themselves. They skim the cream of the crop of the best students off. I know they all could come in from Illinois um, directly to the Valley and to Silicon corridors around the world. And so, you know, what does it mean when the tech sector defunds the public and public goods? And um, I think those of us who work in the public sector, we should be at the forefront of talking about um, what it means when industries don't pay their fair share and they make our institutions, which really are, to me, the bedrock of democracy, um, and, you know, in terms of education and literacy, these things are so incredibly important, you know, the ability to work. Um, we should be at the forefront of taking on um, these conversations, because what has happened is our institutions have been made so vulnerable that then industry can come back around, the tech industry in particular, and cherry pick researchers favorable to their interests, cherry pick departments that are favorable to their interests. Um, and um, also come in, rush in with their products and services, quite frankly. I mean, think about Illinois, Silicon Prairie. We're 
Silicon Prairie is like one of the first, most important, robust public internet um, technology development sites in the world. And look at the degree to which um, that work has been defunded in service of like kind of, you know, corporate um, interested private sector technology development. So we've lost, we, you know, we've contributed a, a lot at Illinois, but we've also lost a lot of our leadership in that space to really break through and as a viable alternative. And I think that's really a, a huge opportunity still before us. Thank you, Sophia. Your talk uh, really landed very well here and I very much appreciate it. I think like the, um, you can see in the background, the lighting in the top of the tower, I, I see you as a, a beacon that really does help bring awareness to our world and um, really guides us in how to navigate some of the perils that we're facing as we, as we move uh, in this um, in this era. So thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for sharing with us today. And um, we're so grateful that you could be here. Thank you so much. And um, a lot of friends in the chat sending messages. And I just want to say sending love to all of you. So great to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming out. And just thank you for being, um, you know, this foundational community for me and for my work. I'm so grateful and I appreciate you all so much.